Okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, the macroeconomic aims of the government and uh, we will um, discuss this today from the point of view of uh, IGCSC and O-level students. Okay, so uh, these are things that we've already done uh, from university and A-level viewpoint, but uh, uh, in this video we are looking at it from the point of view of <coughs> O-level and IGCSC. So let's quickly go to the first point, which is what role does the government play in the market? So the government, now let's look at it from the bigger angle. The government is there to control the country and the market and the economy as a whole. <clears throat> so the role of the government is to basically uh, try to avert market failures and we know what market failures are when markets do not bring about the right allocation of resources as they are supposed to do so the government steps in in order to correct the possibility of these market failures in this situation the government performs various roles the government's role can be the role of a first and foremost it can be an employer okay so the government here becomes an employer uh, employer, of course, means that <clears throat> the first thing that we have to know about the government is that the government itself is an organization. It's a super massive organization in any country. Uh, and then under the government, there are various organizations at various levels. There can be state level organizations. Uh, you know, in in, uh, in certain countries, they might be called the provincial organizations at the provincial level. Or there can be national organizations which are very huge and very big. They exist at the national level. Uh, for example, in America, there is NTSB, the National Transport Safety Board, which is a massive organization. And likewise, uh, there are other organizations that are owned by the government, either at the state level or the province level or at the national level. The important thing is that the government provides employment to people in these organizations. They become what are called government employees. So government here is acting as an employer. Once the government owns organizations, of course, it also becomes a producer. It becomes the owner of factors of production, which remind you uh, in, a, in, a, in a free market, are to be owned by private individuals only but in this situation the government becomes the owner of the factors of production as well and when it becomes the owner of the factors of production it produces goods which are undersupplied by the private sector which the private sector does not find very profitable to supply and these include education healthcare or well, the classic example here will be street lights street lights are not provided by the private sector because they cannot be charged for uh, and there are state agencies like the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, which are responsible for managing the airports or, um, you know, in, in England, they have the Bank of England, which is responsible for managing other banks or controlling other banks. Then the government is also a provider. The role here becomes very supportive. The supportive role means that it, in certain countries, it can provide free education. In other countries, it can provide free housing. So it can look after people who are disabled, who cannot look after themselves. So government here is the provider. Government also, the, the fourth role of the government is as a consumer. Whatever is being produced in the country, uh, and it's already there in existence, the government is not going to consume that. Please do keep that in mind. Government consumes things in massive quantities but in order to consume, those things will first have to be constructed or brought into existence. For example, the government will not say, uh, we are going to purchase an existing building. No, that, that's not the way it goes. Okay. The government says, build 100 buildings, we are going to purchase them. Okay. It's, it works like that. When the government says we are going to purchase, the thing is actually to be built. Government purchases things which are already not in existence. The government doesn't need to, you know, ID, uh, uh, or in a typical situation, the government does not need to buy something which is already there. It can always nationalize. Very bad thing to do, but it can do it. So the government normally buys things which are not there in existence beforehand. 
the government can say we will buy roads build 50 highways and we are going to purchase them so the highways are not there they'll have to be built now the government will have to what will the government have to do it will have to spend money so that those highways can be built the same is true for bridges the bridges are not there when the government says we want to buy the bridges it means the government is saying we are giving you the money construct it now when the construction takes place thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of people maybe will get employment they get employment they get more income the national income of the country goes up the same is true of dams the government can purchase a dam the dam doesn't exist the dam will have to be built for the government to purchase it so we, we are going to look at that uh, in a little bit more detail later on but now let's uh, look at another function of the government another function of the government is that of a lawmaker or a regulator the government regulates how people behave and the government regulate how firms behave and one very important way that they can do it is that they can institute some price controls okay uh, maximum price minimum price we will see later on what that means okay uh, finally for all these activities and in order to carry out its functions the government will have to need money now where does the money come from the money for the government comes from what are called taxes the the government imposes taxes on the on the on the people and then through these taxes it raises what is called revenue or the earning and these earnings are then used for the various functions of the uh, of the government so uh, so these uh, so here the government is basically raising revenue it's raising taxes now please do keep in mind that the national uh, um, microeconomics was the study of how firms households and individuals allocate resources when you talk about the microeconomy it's the study of how the how three actors in the country behave individuals households firms how they allocate resources when you talk about macroeconomy we are talking about one large huge overarching market which is the national economy when all the households are added up all the individuals are added up all the markets are added up all the firms are added up what do you get you get the national economy now the macroeconomy studies how this huge super national economy works that means that there is a definite link between these two economies. There's a link between the macroeconomy and the microeconomy. If, let's say, the firms decide to uh, increase their output, it's a decision being made at the firm level, at the micro level, but it will definitely have an impact on the overall national economy as well. So, uh, so these, these are some of the things. There is one very important concept which we study in uh, macroeconomics and that is what is called the circular flow of income. The circular flow of income simply means that let's assume that in a country there are two sectors, there are two parts of that economy. One are the households and the others are the firms. Okay, So the households are places where people live and firms are the places where people work. Just, this is just a very simplified assumption. So they are both dependent on one another. How are they dependent? The firm needs factors of production in order to produce. The firm, let's say, needs labor. So the households will provide workers to the firms. Of course, the owners of the firms also do not sleep in the firms. They live in the household. So they provide land for the firms on which they can do their operations. So the households provide labor, they provide land, and they provide the capital with which the firms can carry on the business. Now, when the firms carry on the business, what do they make? They make profits, but for the workers who are working there, they get wages. These wages are earned by the workers who come back to their households. They bring money to their houses, to their homes. And then they go and purchase products back from the firms. So the money then again goes back to the firm. That money is then used to produce more goods and services and provide more employment to people from the households. And the, and the process 
goes on. The money keeps circulating in a circular flow from the firm to the household, back to the firm, and then the cycle goes on. So this is the circular flow of income, right? Uh, if at certain stage, the demand for the products goes down, then what's going to happen? Just think about it yourself. If the demand for the products in the country goes down, less products will be manufactured because the demand is less. When less products are manufactured, what happens? Firms are going to cut the workers. They are going to say, we don't want more workers because we don't need to make a lot of products. That means there's going to be unemployment. People in the households will not have jobs. Once there is unemployment, then what's going to happen? Then uh, incomes of the people fall. They are further going to cut their demand. This is also a vicious cycle. They cut their demand. Again, firms will uh, produce less and less goods. Okay. So uh, the key to development or the key to the earnings of a nation from this point of view, or the key to the income of a nation from this point of view, is demand in the economy as a whole. And we call this demand aggregate demand. Okay, aggregate demand. So, aggregate demand, what does it simply mean? Total demand for goods and services in the country. And what is this equal to? There's a definite formula and there's a definite graph which you need to understand. So that formula for aggregate demand in the country is C, which is consumption expenditure, money that people spend on what they will consume themselves, plus investment expenditure. Investment here means money which the businesses will spend uh, for their business activities or their factories or their expansion activities. Money that the government will spend, the dams that the government will build and buy, the bridges that the government will build and buy. Of course, if the government spends more, then more people get employed. When more people get employed, more people have money in their pockets. When they have money in their pockets, they demand more goods. Aggregate demand of the country goes up. And then there's a final thing, exports, net exports. So exports, if your demand for goods and services in the international market is high, then what, what's going to happen? People are going to demand more of your goods. More goods will be manufactured in the firms inside your country. More people will get employment. They will earn. And when they export, now they are not going to earn in uh, the local currency. They are going to earn dollars. That means more aggregate demand will increase. People, people's purchasing power will go up exponentially. So aggregate demand goes up when consumption goes up, investment goes up, government expenditure goes up, and exports go up. Aggregate, expended, ag aggregate demand goes down when consumption goes down, investment goes down, government expenditure goes down, and exports go down. So let's look at this curve, the AD curve, which you can see here, the AD curve is the aggregate demand curve. And when it goes up, what happens? Your Y is your national income. It's also called GDP, gross domestic product or national income. It increases from Y1 to Y2, which means your economy expands, your economy becomes better, and there is a slight increase in prices as well. Okay, so that is uh, up till now, and we will continue with the discussion on the macroeconomy in the later videos. Okay, thank you very much indeed.